Good afternoon and welcome everybody. Welcome to this joint webinar between EVA and the EAS. This is the first and hopefully certainly not the last of the webinars that we hope to be conducting this year. And this is part of our um, series of Af or, or webinars for colleagues in Africa and the MENA region. My name is Koshik Ray, I'm president of the European Atherosclerosis Society, and it's my great pleasure to welcome my co-chair, Professor Alberto Zambon from the EAS. Alberto, welcome. Thank you, Kosh. And I, I just want to, before we say, I just want to give a brief insight into the EAS. And you can see so many friends and colleagues who represent a large and important geographical uh, region of the world. And traditionally, there are many parts of the world that have been underserved in terms of education, in terms of policy. And one of the things that I was very keen on trying to do when I became EAS president is actually to look at all the hard work, the science, and how we could try and implement that, and how we could actually reach out and help colleagues in other parts of the world so that we actually improve health and we prevent atherosclerosis. And what you're seeing is really some of the foremost, the, the key leaders in your region. And I'm delighted that so many of you are joining us. I encourage you to come to the EAS conference in Milan, which will be at least part in person. We're expecting at least 1,500 delegates. There will also be a hybrid format. And there are many opportunities for your young researchers to look at young investigator awards to enable them to travel. We'll be conducting many of these additional webinars looking at rare lipids, management of atherosclerosis, as well as some of the policy documents that many of us are involved with. So there's a huge opportunity. And with that, I'm going to hand over to my co-chair, Alberto Zambon. Professor Zambon, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ray. Thank you, Kosh. Uh, my name is Alberto Zambon. I'm an Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Padova, interested in lipids since many, many years. And as a co-chair, it's a great privilege to present this joint webinar by European Atherosclerosis Society, the Egyptian Association of Vascular Biology and Atherosclerosis, with the support of other national African societies, including the Lipid and Atherosclerosis Society of Southern Africa, Nigeria Cardiac Society, and Tunisian Heart Foundation. The first webinar will focus on practical clinical aspects related to the management of this lipidemia, starting with a look at familial hypercholesterolemia with an update uh, at the worldwide situation, then focusing on atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in developing countries, how to recognize and diagnose different forms of this lipidemia based on lipid analysis in the African region. Uh, we have the honor and the privilege to host three outstanding speakers, as well as eminent moderators with leading roles in their African national societies. Uh, let me do a housekeeping before we start the webinar. Uh, duty. The, there is a, a Q&A session at the end of the three presentations, so please write your questions on the chat box throughout the presentations, and the chair, moderators, and speakers will answer them in the Q&A part of this webinar at the end of the presentation. Without any further delay, any further ado, let me introduce our first speaker, is Professor Kosh Ray, is Professor of Public Health at the School of Public Health, Director uh, of the Imperial Center of Cardiovascular Disease Prevention at Imperial College in London, UK, and is the current president of the European Atherosclerosis Society. Professor Ray will provide uh, an overview on the FH worldwide at 2021 snapshot. Professor Ray, the podium is yours. Hello, everybody. Thank you for this opportunity to come and speak to you today. It's a very exciting symposium that we've got, and I'm gonna cover familial hypercholesterolemia. What is the status of play worldwide? And what did we know in 2021? So it was my privilege, these are a list of my disclosures. It was my privilege to have established and designed the FH Studies Collaboration over six, seven years ago now. And this basically consists of a group of collaborators all around the world, representing about now 68 countries. These are some of the national leads that you can see in Egypt uh, and Africa is certainly represented in this global collaboration. And this paper last year in The Lancet summarizes the global state of play and it's being used to inform policy 
and guide changes in the future around the world. So what did we learn from this huge outtaking? Well, what we learned was that we were able to describe the characteristics of patients around the world. We already know that FH is prevalent in about one in 311 individuals globally on average. And what we wanted to do is to understand how these patients are diagnosed, how they're managed, and what the clinical consequences might be. To do this, we've looked at the overall data, we then broadened that, or we've narrowed that down to look by WHO regions, by gender. And we know that screening is important. So we've also looked at the data by index and non-index cases. So the data I'm gonna show you refers to adults 18 years or over with a clinical or genetic diagnosis of probable or definite heterozygous FH. And this is cross-sectional data. The data set is large. You can see that at the time we, this was published, we had over 61,000 individuals, but the final data set I'm gonna show you refers to about 42,000 individuals. The majority of people around the world are diagnosed firstly using Dutch lipid network criteria. And what you can see is that with genetics alone, which basically uh, is, is now becoming increasingly available, about 15% of people around the world are diagnosed with genetic criteria, molecular diagnosis alone. So these are the WHO regions as, as defined, and you can see the contributions from different regions of the world. So uh, the, the contribution from Africa is not insignificant. We have neighboring Eastern Mediterranean and we have Southeast Asia. So you can see that compared to, to Western Europe and certainly North America in particular, we do need to collect even more data, but we've made a start at least. And what we can see first of all is there is a big problem. This is a genetic condition present from birth. The average age of diagnosis around the world is shown in this slide. The average age overall is about 44 years. That means we have missed 44 years of an opportunity to change the life course because you can't start treatment until you make a diagnosis. And you can see that there is some variation with, for example, Europe uh, in, in particular, having diagnosed patients a little bit earlier, but Southeast Asia and the Pacific region about five years later. And are there any consequences to this? Well, we'll look at that in a bit more detail. There are some gender differences as well. This is a condition that affects men and women equally. It's autosomal dominant, but women are diagnosed later than men. And that will be relevant for a couple of different reasons that I'm going to show you later on. So globally, the average age of diagnosis is in the mid 40s. Only about 40% of people are diagnosed before the age of, of 40. And if you look at the when we should be making a diagnosis, which is probably before the age of 20, only 2% of the global population are diagnosed in those first two decades of life. Why is that important? Well, that's important because dyslipidemia and elevated LDL cholesterol does not travel alone in terms of increasing risk of cardiovascular disease. This is age and the uh, per percentage, this is age on the y-axis, and this is the percentage of people with hypertension and diabetes by age. You can see that with increasing age, other risk factors become more common, like hypertension and diabetes. So if you're making a diagnosis later in life, you're already not just dealing with an elevated LDL cholesterol, but you're dealing with additional risk factors which will accelerate the risk of cardiovascular disease. You might say that, okay, well, maybe, uh, you know, things like BMI, et cetera, don't matter, or diabetes may not matter as much in FH individuals because there's some data suggesting that they are less likely to have uh, diabetes. Well, that's not necessarily true because if your behavior is such that you are overweight or obese, for example, and you can see the data here, and you make a diagnosis of FH late, behaviors are already starting to have an impact. So BMI will go up with age, and it will be particularly relevant in North Africa and, and the Eastern Mediterranean regions, because here BMI is much, much higher 
than in the rest of the world by the time a diagnosis is made. And if BMI is already higher, then we know that's going to be a problem in terms of diabetes risk, an additional risk factor that will accelerate disease. Now, if you look at vascular diseases, the major manifestation of FH at the time of diagnosis is with coronary disease. It's not with strokes. Remember, stroke is largely related to hypertension and tends to occur a decade or so later. The same is true in people with FH. So if you're reliant on the index event being stroke, you're probably going to wait a lot longer to make a diagnosis. And that means you've missed probably another decade or so of life. More common than stroke is peripheral arterial disease. So in particular, if we see people with peripheral arterial disease or premature coronary disease, we should have a high index of suspicion if the LDL is high that this is FH. We can also see that the likelihood of, of coronary disease increases with the starting pre-treatment level of LDL cholesterol. So that means two important things. We need to make the diagnosis early, but we need to get back all of those missed years by trying to lower LDL cholesterol as much as possible. And if you make the diagnosis late, you're going to have to treat LDL cholesterol much more because you've missed many more years of potential treatment. Now, when you look at the data uh, for coronary disease and peripheral arterial disease, et cetera, broken down by age, the same relationship that we see overall is true, i.e. that um, coronary disease is the major manifestation in men or women. But we know that women will develop cardiovascular disease a bit later. So in a woman who we're already diagnosing late, if we're looking at index cases being driven by the presence of vascular disease, we're going to miss many more of these people. So we really need to think about universal screening for everybody early on in life within the first 20 years. And if you then look at what we do when we find these cases, well, as you would hope, there is use of statins. And the average doses that are being used tend to be the more potent statins. It's not quite the top dose about 24 milligrams of rosuvastatin and, uh, and uh, 39 milligrams of atorvastatin. So if you think about it, that we're, we're using one less than the top dose. But the use of combination therapy, which is going to be essential, is lower than we would like because the use of azetamibe is only about 24%. The use of PCSK9 inhibitors is only about 3%. And the breakdown of which type of PCSK9 inhibitors is shown here. Now, the impact of all of this is that we know that women are less likely to get some combination treatments in particular. And you can see this here on this graph, that although the uh, percentage of use of statins is fairly similar, women tend to have a lower use of additional combination therapies by about 1%. This means that their LDL cholesterols are often not as well treated. Now, the age, the LDL levels is going to be partly a function of the age of diagnosis. So if you look at the Netherlands, when they were screening, uh, essentially they were looking at family screening and so forth. They were finding people much, much earlier. The average LDL at diagnosis of F8 is much, much lower. It's 4.43. Remember, you have one abnormal gene, one good gene, but LDL receptor function will decline over time. So if you leave diagnosis 20 years later, even though you've got an FH patient, the good genes are less, fun or if you like, the effect of the good genes on LDL receptor function may be less clear and they may be functioning less well. So it means by the time you diagnose somebody, for example, in Africa, you're diagnosing more severe cases or also you're diagnosing people later, the LDLs are going to be higher and you're trying to reverse the clock. So the answer is early diagnosis, early diagnosis and screening. If you look at what percentage of our patients get to goal, you'll see that even if we aim for a simple goal of 1.8, not even the new goals of 1.4, particularly with FH, with risk factors or ASCVD, less than 3% globally get to goal. That means we're going to need combination therapy. Statin-based monotherapy is not going to work. And the way that we're going to get more and more of these patients to goal 
And it really doesn't matter. You know, men tend to do a little bit better. They tend to be better treated than women. But the way we're going to get to goal is with the use of combination therapy. So if we aim for getting to below 1.8, it's more likely to happen with three drug combinations. We should be starting these patients at least on a combination of statins and azetamide, and where affordable and available, PCSK9 inhibitors are maybe in the future, in clitorin, if that's available, should then go in into the treatment algorithm. And the same is true with a harder to reach goal of 1.4, where again, you're more likely to get to goal with multi-drug combinations. So a simple take-home message is, we need to find these people earlier, we need to treat them more aggressively at the point of diagnosis, not waiting for bad things to happen. Now, finding people early is going to be essential. I, I've shown you the overall age of diagnosis, but look at the index cases. So index cases often will be somebody's had a heart attack. So something bad has happened, and then we're trying to reverse this whole process. The average age of, of index cases with FH is 50. But when we go out systematically looking for these people, we find them earlier. And the average age is six years younger. What happens when you find people earlier? So the non-index cases, well, they're less likely to have vascular disease. And that's exactly what you're trying to prevent by finding people early and treating them more aggressively. The answer is actually really very simple. We need to find these people earlier whether you're a man or a woman, and because women in particular, there's a huge unmet need because they're less likely to get vascular diseases. They are less likely to be picked up. But remember, if, an, if, a, if a woman has FH and she has children, each child has a 50% chance of being affected. So this is really why, although we need to find those people already living with FH who are now out there, we also need to think about future and think about preventing things early by systematic universal screening for cholesterol before the age of 20. So with that, I'm going to look forward to questions and answers later on. But I want to thank all of the investigators, many of you who've participated to make these global data possible. There are many more papers that will come out of this network and this registry. And you can see that in Africa, there are many gaps still that we want to fill in. So if you're not part of the FH Studies collaboration, please go to the EAS website and ask to join and see how you can participate. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Ray. Thank you, Kosh, for this uh, very uh, comprehensive and clinically relevant updated uh, uh, review on FH worldwide. Um, once again, before we move on to the second presentation, let me remind you that the, the Q&A session will be at the end of the presentation, so you're able to write your questions at any time during the presentation on the chat box, and this question will be answered at the end of the third and last presentation by the chair, the moderators, and the speakers. Now, once again, we'll move to the second presentation, who will be given by Professor Ashraf Reda. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Reda, for helping us hosting this uh, joint webinar. Professor Reda is a professor of cardiology at the Cardiology Department, College of Medicine, Menofi University, and he is the current president of the Egyptian Association for Vascular Biology and Atherosclerosis. Uh, professor Reda will present uh, data on the scope of the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, scope of the problem in developing countries. Professor Reda, the podium is yours. Uh, thank you, Alberto. Thank you, Dr. Ray, and uh, uh, great thanks to the European Atherosclerosis Society for uh, sharing with us uh, this important meeting and many uh, uh, other previous meetings. Uh, let me uh, start slideshow. You, you are seeing my screen? Yes, not on the slide, uh, not on the full screen mode, but uh, we're seeing your okay, slide. Okay, I'll try to... Uh... Just have uh, Professor Reda. Okay. Uh, okay, so after the uh, uh, great uh, 
uh, knowledge we heard from Dr. Ray about this important study, uh, global uh, 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 situations regarding the uh, familial hypercholesterolemia. And we are uh, uh, proud to share uh, with the S in uh, this uh, uh, study. And I hope many uh, countries of Africa will share in uh, further uh, studies and uh, sharing uh, knowledge uh, with everybody. Uh, looking at the risk factors in developing country, I think, first of all, all of us know that risk factor profiles may not always be the same uh, uh, in different uh, ethnic groups, in different uh, geographical uh, uh, situations. For example, this is a paper about the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in South Asians, and uh, uh, all of, uh, of us know that there is a, a, a high incidence of premature atherosclerosis, for example, in South Asians, and the conclusions of these studies uh, showed that uh, there's, there was greater prevalence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease than other ethnic groups, and actually around 50% of the populations there more likely to die from uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, uh, mortality rate have doubled in the past 20 years from atherosclerosis. Uh, other the conclusion is that up to 25% of myocardial infarction, for example, in India, occur in individuals under the age of 40, compared uh, to uh, around 5% in the Western Europe. Uh, uh, many, many other, many uh, suggestions for why this happens, maybe uh, lipoprotein little a, maybe homocysteines, inflammations, the multiple risk factor uh, presentations. Uh, and so, so risk factors may differ uh, in different uh, uh, ethnic groups and different countries. Uh, and that's why I think uh, uh, the, our project about the risk factors in Egyptians may have some importance uh, uh, because, you know, um, Egypt has uh, 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 the sense from many, many theories of the sense of the Egyptians and even the Egyptian pharaohs. Some say that Egyptian pharaohs are mainly Nubians and from Africa, and uh, and some say that uh, there is a blue eye theory and the uh, many of the Egyptian descent pharaohs from uh, uh, southern of Europe. And if you look at, uh, look at this nice picture on the right side of uh, 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 different colors uh, of, of, of the pharaohs, so actually uh, Egypt is the most populous country in the uh, area. Uh, uh, more than 15% 15, 15 of cardiovascular deaths in the region occur in Egypt. Uh, and that data actually lacking regarding atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So we think that if we look at the risk factors in the Egyptians, it may help to understand this area uh, uh, of uh, the world. Uh, and as you know, if you go backward in the uh, uh, our uh, nice work of our colleague, Dr. Adel Alam from Azhar University, uh, about the uh, examinations of uh, some mummies by uh, CT scan and showing that uh, uh, there was plaque in the aorta uh, 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 these mummies who died early uh, around the age of in the, in the 30s or something like that. So it's, it seems that premature atherosclerosis pre present in our genes since thousands of years. Uh, so when we start this uh, uh, cardio risk project in Egypt, uh, uh, we decided to use patients with acute coronary syndrome because patient with acute coronary syndrome is an easy uh, subject to collect data. Patient in the hospital for a couple of days, uh, we, we 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 can uh, uh, do some laboratory work. We uh, take good history. Uh, so actually, this project ran from 2015 to 2018, it included uh, more than 3,000 patients from ar ar about 31 centers uh, all over uh, uh, Egypt, and all of the, these patients is with an acute coronary syndrome patients. Uh, I would like to thank, of course, uh, uh, about 36 cardiac risk investigators and co-investigators and the centers they work in it. Um, we published this uh, data, some uh, abstracts in the atherosclerosis in the European Heart Journal, and uh, the full paper was published in the Journal of Public Health of Africa about the prevalence of atherosclerotic risk factor in Egyptian patients with acute 
coronary syndrome. If we look generally at the uh, uh, whole samples of patients to look at, the, for example, at the traditional risk factors, uh, hypertension was present in 53%, dyslipidemia in 31%, high prevalence of type 2 diabetes, around 40%. Smoking is striking uh, risk factors. Uh, current smoking is 48%. And ex-smoker recently because of disease are 12%. So around 60% of patients admitted with acute coronary syndromes are either current or ex-smokers. Uh, we have a problem with abdominal obesity and the body mass index. This is general, all, all, all the sample, uh, examining all the sample. If we look at the gender difference, risk factors according to gender, or risk factors according to the age groups, we noticed that our young uh, patients with acute coronary syndrome, the main risk factors may be smoking. Uh, uh, the elderly patient, the main risk factors was uncontrolled hypertension. Regarding our women, the main risk factors are diabetes, obesity, and dyslipidemia. So, uh, for example, if you wanted to adopt uh, a preventive strategy to, uh, to regarding atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, we can run a campaign against smoking in the young. We can encourage our female, our women, to do exercise, uh, lifestyle intervention, dieting. Uh, we, we, we wanted to learn uh, to uh, the, the physicians and the elderly that Hypertension is not a usual finding in the elderly, and we have to treat the elderly good regarding blood pressure uh, control. One of the striking fi findings, as you expect in Egypt, like many other underdeveloped country, is the high prevalence of premature atherosclerosis. And this is a, a paper about the premature coronary atherosclerosis in Egyptians, uh, data from the cardiac risk projects. In, in our males with acute coronary syndrome, around 49% of the sample was in acute coronary syndrome, and this num uh, percentage is even higher in the woman because by definition, women with premature those lost less than 60 years uh, of age. Um, we, we are proud to share this, sort of, of course, information with the uh, uh, study, uh, Familia FH study collaborations. Uh, and I, I encourage all our colleagues in the African country to share in uh, the activities and research activities of the European Atherosclerosis Society. It's really uh, uh, help, very helpful to have uh, important data. So the problem of premature atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, the question is why? Why premature atherosclerosis? There is many explanations. Of course, the presence of multiple risk factors due to a bad lifestyle intervention, due to smoking, diabetes, hypertension is important. Drugs and substances are important in, in many uh, areas of the world. And this is a paper uh, uh, from USA about the uh, MI in the young and drug and the substance was very important risk factors. Of course, FH and the high genetic susceptibility is a very important cause of premature atherosclerosis. If you look at FH and the prevalence of uh, familial hypercholesterolemia, we notice some worldwide data about the uh, uh, possibility of heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia in patients with admitted with premature acute coronary syndrome. Uh, this is a comparison between the possibility of heterozygous family hypercholesterolemia in patients without premature atherosclerosis and in patients with uh, atherosclerosis, maybe 20% only if there is no premature atherosclerosis, and this percent jump to 50% if you have premature atherosclerosis. So the possibility and the probability of heterozygous or uh, uh, familial hypercholesterolemia is, uh, should be encountered when you have a patient with premature uh, uh, atherosclerosis. So the second study was about uh, a sub-analysis of the cardio risk projects to try to estimate the prevalence of familial hypercalcemia among Egyptian patients with acute uh, uh, coronary syndromes. Uh, in this uh, analysis, we uh, 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 group the patients with premature atherosclerosis and LDL above 155 to 250. Uh, and this is considered according to the Dutch network criteria, a possible FH uh, uh, patients. Then other group of patients with premature atherosclerosis and the LDL is a little bit higher, above 250 to 325. And this is by definition, 
Deutsche criteria is a probable case of familial hypercholesterolemia. Of course, those patients above 325 milligram per deciliter LDL is a definite cases of familial hypercholesterolemia. So these are the uh, uh, number of possible, probable, and definite if each patient ab- among patients with premature acute cross syndrome in the cardio risk projects. If you look at the uh, if if you if we look at the other group of patients without premature atherosclerosis, here the LDL requirement to diagnose is much higher. So those with not, without premature and LDL above 190 is a possible case, and those with above 325 is a probable case. So by the end of these calculations, uh, 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 we uh, 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 conclude that the estimated prevalence. If at least possible FH among Egyptian patients with acute coronary syndrome is about 17%. And as Dr. Koshik uh, 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 noted that the, those patients are diagnosed at age of 40, 45, and we miss a, a, a long years, many years, without diagnosis, without screening, without uh, trying to prevent the catastrophic event that may uh, affect his uh, life. Uh, of course, I will. Uh, I, I want to congratulate uh, Kojik Ray and the, all the group for the paper published in Lance about the global perspective of familial hypercholesterolemia. And um, uh, thanks to cooperations with the, uh, all the group we have to, uh, we, 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 we share in this uh, paper by some of our uh, cases. So the, the other important uh, factor is uh, the genetic susceptibility. We know that many of those premature atherosclerosis, cardiovascular disease, uh, is due to actually monogenic defects that lead to heterozygous or homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. But very important other uh, factors is the high genetic susceptibility. We know that many of us are born genetically predisposed to atherosclerosis, not due to monogenic defects that lead to FH, but maybe due to a polygenic defect that affect many genes that control blood pressure, endothelial functions, uh, metabolism, diabetes. And if you if you look at the our patient in Egypt with premature atherosclerosis, we will notice that. Uh, there is high prevalence of other risk factors, even in those with FH, like hypertension, of course, smoking, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, for example. So actually, genetic susceptibility is another important area that should be looked for to try to uh, prevent atherosclerosis early as much as uh, uh, we can. And uh, as you know, there is a lot of risk alleles in our body that can lead to atherosclerosis. Many of us are born with a lot of risk alleles that can affect, for example, lipid metabolism, blood pressure control, uh, 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 nitroglycide signaling, vascular remodeling. So the more risk alleles you are born with, the more liable you will have atherosclerosis early. And this is, paper was in 2018. It was around, at that time the to, uh, about 164 uh, coronary artery disease risk loci, but nowadays there are hundreds of risk loci are discovered. So the balance between these ri- bad alleles or risk alleles or SNPs mutations uh, uh, and the good alleles can uh, uh, determine at what age one of us will have uh, atherosclerosis. So that's why uh, uh, polygenic disorders is important. Polygenic risk is important, and genetic risk score may be as important as uh, familial hypercholesterolemia. Uh, and unfortunately, this polygenic uh, um, uh, coronary artery disease polygenic risk cannot be discovered by the traditional way, a clinical way, and this is a conventional clinical parameters do not distinguish patients at high polygenic risk for coronary artery disease. So that's why, that's why genetic risk scoring system may be one of the future tools that help in uh, uh, diagnosis uh, those at higher risk of ischemic disease. And you know that even those with familiar hypercholesterolemia can be reclassified according to genetic risk score. Some of the patients with familiar hypercholesterolemia at, at higher risk because they have other polygenic factors, and some of FH patients may have lower risk 
relatively, of course, lower risk according to this polygenic risk uh, score. So I can conclude, uh, uh, dear colleagues, that risk factors distribution differs in different ethnic groups, environments, genetic backgrounds, premature atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease is a worldwide problem. A lot should be done to understand the epidemiology, phenotypes, pathophysiology, and risk assessment of familial hypercholesterolemia. Of course, early evaluation of polygenic risk score and genetic risk scores are needed uh, to uh, uh, adopt a more powerful uh, preventive strategy regarding atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Reda, for this uh, uh, very clinically relevant uh, uh, overview on the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk factors, particularly focusing on the Egyptian population. Thank you very much for this contribution. Let's move on to the uh, third presentation, who will be given by Professor David Murray, uh, who is a professor emeritus of chemical pathology from the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Uh, David is also the president of the Lipid and Atherosclerosis Society of Southern Africa, and he'll be talking the next uh, 15 minutes uh, about diagnosis of dyslipidemia and the lipogram. So it's a practical way for this uh, much-weighted early recognition of dyslipidemia. David, uh, the podium is yours. I am grateful for the opportunity to meet with other interested parties in Africa with the purpose of If there are technical problems, I think Professor Murray is ready to give his presentation live. Alberto, I think we, if, if, if there is technical problem, we, we are fixing it. We can. Uh, uh, Dr. Ray is with us, still with us? Oh, yes, he is with us. Most of you will know that there have been tremendous advances in understanding the causes of dyslipidemia and in the treatment of dyslipidemia that I hope we can translate into practice for the population in Africa. Before discussing aspects of the clinical assessment, I would like to make some remarks to put lipidology into perspective and also need to stress that the diagnosis of the lipid disorders is made in a biochemical phenotype based on a routine lipid profile, which for screening purposes can be done randomly, but a fasting sample is especially important to assess hypertriglyceridemic patients better. We rely on a routine fasting triglyceride, total cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, and very often on lipoprotein little a for our clinical practice and electrophoresis to discern small LDL at moderate LDL dyslipidemia and dysbeta lipoproteinemia as well as lipoprotein X is useful. Management decisions will be commented on at the end. Lipidology is a relatively new discipline that, just like other fields of medicine, aims to improve health, to prevent disease, and to treat people at risk for disease and those who have had complications. The main sphere of activity is in atherosclerosis, which is due to lipoproteins containing APO lipoprotein B or a lack of high density lipoproteins. Pancreatitis is <clears throat> typically associated with more severe hypertriglyceridemia as well as atherosclerosis. 
But presentation of lipid disorders may also be to pediatricians, neurologists, and dermatologists. The lipids are insoluble in water and the fatty acids are esterified to glycerol as phospholipids and triglyceride, but may also be esterified to cholesterol and there may also be unesterified cholesterol. These are accommodated for transport purposes in lipoproteins. The lipoprotein metabolism is important to understand, but very briefly can be summarized as three main pathways. The exogenous pathway starts in the gut where dietary triglyceride and cholesterol are assembled onto lipo, apolipoprotein B48, which forms chylomicrons and enters the plasma. The endogenous pathway commences in the liver where ApoB100 is the template for assembling triglyceride and cholesterol for export into the plasma. Both the chylomicrons and the VLDL undergo modification in plasma in which the triglycerides are removed and remnants are formed. These remnants are cleared by virtue of ApoE into the liver, but some of the remnants are converted to LDL, which is now practically containing only cholesterol and will be uptaken by cells requiring cholesterol by the expression of the LDL receptor. And this is most active in the liver and other cells that have a high need for cholesterol. Reverse cholesterol transport is undertaken with high density lipoprotein and this Lipoprotein has many other immunoinflammatory functions as well as vascular effects. Lipoprotein X can cause severe hypercholesterolemia and relates to bile acid elevation and is not normally present in the plasma. Now the plasma concentrations are obviously the balance of the production and clearance rates as well as the effectiveness of processing them in the plasma. Critical steps at assembly, modification or clearance will alter the concentrations and cause significant derangements. Pathological effects may already be seen at the embryonal level, but also in children and adults. And the emphasis may be in cellular metabolism, organ function, or blood vessel disease. We all know that atherosclerosis is common and increasing and may be in certain settings particularly premature. It is uh, treatable and screening for at-risk people is therefore important for intervention and this requires a very good clinical assessment as well as the routine uh, lipogram mentioned. The diagnosis should be as accurate as possible for the best prognostic and therapeutic considerations. Normally, <clears throat> the clinical practice involves the phenotype of dyslipoproteinemia based on the clinical findings and context as well as biochemistry, but increasingly genotyping is allowing us to pinpoint the cause of the dyslipidemia. So the cause of the dyslipidemia may of course be secondary to other disorders and dyslipidemia may also be unifactorial with a single gene being implicated or polygenic in which a constellation of variants promote the dyslipidemia. Special investigations may need to be done in more unusual and severe cases. 
including electrophoresis, spatial genetic testing, enzymology, and others. The therapeutic decisions is based on knowing the underlying pathophysiology and the risk of the disorder. For atherosclerosis, the risk is multifactorial in most cases, and one decides about treatment after a risk calculation. However, most of the monogenic disorders have very high risk and will be treated in primary prevention before any vascular disease has occurred. When the patient is assessed, one takes a history about symptoms of cardiovascular disease or symptoms that may suggest secondary dyslipidemia. It is also important to consider the diet in detail and the use of alcohol, particularly with hypertriglyceridemia. Smoking is a very important risk factor to take into account and medication may also modify the lipid profile. In some of the disorders, a family history can reveal striking risk of vascular disease, such as in this pedigree in our clinic, where the index case indicated by the arrow arrived in his early 40s with intractable heart failure for transplantation. If one looks at the pedigree, one will see that in his generation, the average age of an event is at 37 years and in his father's generation at 55, whereas in a previous generation, probably with much better lifestyle, the grandfather survived much longer with familial hypercholesterolemia. The physical examination should take into account the weight, height, and features of obesity, and endocrine and organ status should also be assessed relating to dyslipidemia. The stigmata are sought on the head, the skin, and the tendons. Xanthelasma at the eye will be illustrated in the next few slides, as well as arcus cornealis and an opaque cornea and lipemia retinalis. The skin may be involved with xanthomata that could be described as eruptive, tubo-eruptive, tuberous, or planar, and even may occur in the palmar crease. The tendons that are often involved are the Achilles tendon and the extensors of the fingers. Acanthosis nigricans is an important feature to recognize in people with insulin resistance and diabetes and obviously a cardiovascular examination <clears throat> is vital to detect vascular disease. Xanthomata are very important physical signs and involve lesions containing foam cells that accumulate neutral lipid and often elicit a fibrotic response in the lesion. Owing to the carotene, they are yellow to orange in color, except when due to lipoprotein X, when carotene is lacking. Eruptive xanthomata in the skin coalesce to form tubo-eruptive xanthomata and tuberous xanthomata. So if one wants to assign the dyslipidemia to the physical signs, then a simple rule is to to follow is that hypertriglyceridemia involves the skin, high sterol concentrations involve the tendons, and when the skin and tendons are involved, then one is dealing with a mixed hyperlipidemia of cholesterol and triglyceride or an extreme sterol error. Unfortunately, not all monogenic disorders result in clinical signs and that is why the laboratory testing remains important. Secondary causes can explain cutaneous xanthomata, but not tendon xanthomata. And eruptive xanthomata disappear within days to weeks, whereas tubo-eruptive xanthomata may disappear over months on effective treatment, but tendon xanthomata generally do not decrease in size.
This table will hopefully be useful for future reference to view the various physical signs and lipid parameters with the different lipoprotein phenotypes. It classifies hypocholesterolemia centrally and hypercholesterolemia towards the left, ranging from mild to moderate to severe to extreme at above 15 millimoles per liter. And on the right-hand side is a range of hypertriglyceridemia. Tendon xanthometer occur in plant sterol disorders, cerebrotendinous xanthometer, and in familial hypercholesterolemia, as well as dysbeta lipoproteinemia. The planar xanthometer are typical of homozygous FH, but also of some mixed type lipidemias, and particularly dysbeta lipoproteinemia can cause a range of physical signs that can be quite striking. Arcus cornealis is important to recognize as well. The re relationship between obesity and insulin resistance and acanthosis nigricans is known to almost everyone. Eruptive xanthometer may not always be recognized as a sign of severe hypertriglyceridemia. Likewise, planar xanthometer might be overlooked as they were in this boy with homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. Xanthelasma, as seen as the small yellowish nodule at the medial canthus of the eye in the top left panel, is somewhat nonspecific but is commoner amongst hyperlipidemic people. In the bottom left hand panel is a person who succumbed to myocardial infarction with familial hypercholesterolemia at the age of 32 years. Note that he has xanthelasma and an arcus cornealis as a fine white ring over the iris. The top right hand panel shows a very broad arcus cornealis in a young woman with premature vascular disease due to an abnormality of HDL. And the bottom right-hand panel shows an opaque arc uh, cornea due to very low HDL cholesterol. Examination of the hands can reveal hypercholesterolemia as evidenced by the extensor tendon xanthometer in the top left-hand panel and the combination of cutaneous and tenderness anthometer in the loft, left lower panel is suggestive of homozygous FH with a typical infiltration between the finger webs as on the right lower panel. In the top right panel is the infiltration of carotene containing lipid in the palmar creases that signifies dysbeta lipoproteinemia. When doing fundoscopy for hypertension, one may also be able to identify hypertriglyceridemia as lipemia retinalis, which causes a pacification of the smaller caliber arterioles in this picture. Severe hypertriglyceridemia of lipoprotein lipase deficiency can cause complete lactescence of the plasma, but People presenting with hypertriglyceridemia can respond dramatically to correcting the underlying cause, such as this diabetic illustrates with a triglyceride halving at daily intervals from 42 to 3 millimoles per liter with marginal turbidity in the last sample. Especially in our context, it's not always possible to work up an exact diagnosis for the dyslipidemia, but using the routine lipogram and the clinical context, as well as deciding on therapeutic responses and monitoring them, one after having excluded secondary dyslipidemia, one can 
obtain good control. I need not emphasize the different drug choices for the different disorders at this point, but will mention that dietary intervention can be very effective in certain more severe disorders, but should be generally used in all individuals at risk for heart disease. The secondary causes of dyslipidemia are listed here with hypercholesterolemia relating to high cholesterol and saturated fat intake, as well as hypothyroidism, nephrotic syndrome and cholestasis, and hypertriglyceridemia particularly associates with alcohol use, diabetes, and certain medications. The list of primary causes for dyslipidemia will hopefully be a useful reference later, but on this particular slide, I would like to emphasize the high LDL cholesterol concentrations due to, in the center, the red box with LDL receptor mutations binding defective B100 and PCSK9 gain of function mutations, all of which are associated with familial hypercholesterolemia. In the purple panel on the left hand side is the mixed hyperlipidemia due to dis beta lipoproteinemia that should also be recognized. In conclusion, one should summarize that there is a wide spectrum of lipid and lipoprotein disorders and many of them are atherogenic. Atherosclerosis is common and in almost all instances the lipid profile contributes to the risk. It is important to treat atherosclerosis comprehensively but monogenic disorders have to be recognized for more specific aggressive intervention earlier because of their extremely high risk. Management should be judicious with lifestyle and medication. And the family and community doctor is in an important position to consider dyslipidemias, while specialist and laboratory confirmation may be required for very severe disorders. The management of the uncommon and severe disorders nowadays improves what previously was a dismal prognosis. And in some instances, dietary intervention alone can make an enormous difference. We also know that there are newer therapeutic strategies that will improve matters. Thank you for your attention, and I would be happy to be of assistance if such is desired. Thank you very much, Professor Marais, for this broad, uh, very practical clinical overview of the main phenotypes of dyslipidemia. Let's open up the Q&A session. It's going to be chaired by Professor Kosh Ray. Before giving you the podium to you, Kosh, let me introduce briefly the three colleagues, eminent colleagues that uh, will be the moderators of this session. is Professor Abib Gamra. He is a head of cardiology, Department of Fatuma Bourguiba University Hospital in Monasty, Tunisia. Is the president, Professor Gammer is the president of Tunisian Heart Foundation and the vice president of North uh, Pan Pacific Society of Cardiology. The second moderator will be Professor Oga, who is a, a consultant cardiologist in the Division of Cardiology, Department of Medicine, University College Hospital, Ibadan, Nigeria, and is the president of Nigeria Cardiac Society. And Professor Alexandros Stelepis, a professor of biochemical and clinical chemistry in the University of Ioannina, Greece. Is also a director of the Atherothrombosis Research Center at the same university and the president of the Hellenic Atherosclerosis Society. Professor Celepis is also involved in many educational activities organized by the EAS. Uh, Kosh, the uh, podium is yours to run the Q&A session. Great. Thank you very much, Alberto. I just want to remind everybody that you can send from the audience. Please do send questions through the chat function and the, um, there's a Q&A box and we'll do our best to answer. But if I could basically maybe start and put a question to, um, to David. David, I think one of the key things you've, you've, you know, you've highlighted very nicely are the, the clinical scenarios, how we look at these lipid disorders. 
And if we, I've heard you talk about this passionately many times about how this is underserved in Africa in particular. And lipidology and training lipidologists obviously takes time. But we have seen really quite an expansion of cardiology and internal medicine. And perhaps what we should be thinking about are those people, instead of being much more simply procedure driven, thinking about prevention, which ties into some of the stuff that I was talking about. What are your thoughts about that? And how would we do that? Yes, I fully agree. I, you know, the, uh, um, just to make the comment that I suspect that the first patient with a heart transplant that was done in Cape Town actually had familial hypercholesterolemia, but I've not been able to get hold of some of the pathology samples to confirm that diagnosis. But the clinical setting was appropriate for FH necessitating the transplant in his early 50s. So our cardiologists are quite busy uh, dealing with the complications, and uh, there hasn't been much emphasis on the uh, proactive aspect of cardiology, and that it may be partly attributable to the somewhat negative feelings in the 1980s, but certainly since the 1990s with the statins, um, this, uh, the general use of statins increased, but FH is not recognized as something that stands out uh, with much higher risk and that requires treatment much earlier. So unfortunately, in our cardiology, it's not really uh, taken off to treat cardiologists to recognize uh, FH. But since it's such a common condition, I think every general practitioner should actually be aware of it and uh, consider diagnosing it. And of course, if one deals with a family, there are the um, other family members who need screening. And uh, we unfortunately also don't have a cascade testing service. So the, the primary healthcare physician becomes very important. Thank you, David, really well put. Professor Gamera, you have your hand raised, please. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Professor Ray, and thank you, everyone, for the kind of invitation. I'm really delighted to be part of this uh, important webinar. <clears throat> uh, what uh, I just have uh, questions to all the speakers, but I would start by Professor Ray. Uh, I, I'm really sorry that Africa was participating with only two percent of the uh, included in the uh, in your large in the large registry of family. Hypercholesterolemia. Uh, my question to you: uh, the chance of having a subgroup analysis where actually you could focus on regional differences, not only Africa but uh, worldwide, because actually it's a, it's a worldwide registry. But even it with the two percent uh, participating, two percent from African participants. Uh, have you noticed any regional differences in terms of uh, age of detection, for example, prevalence? That's a very good question. So the issue with, with prevalence, um, I think, is that a lot of... So in a registry, the people that are more active and you, you get a certain amount of bias um, that basically those people more interested will participate. So, so it's difficult to look at prevalence with this type of data. However, when you look at other studies, and we, we published a systematic review and meta-analysis, and the global prevalence is about one in 311. And unless you have a founder effect, it's probably very consistent around the world. So it's let's call it one in 300. That, that's what it is, whether it's Asia, whether it, it, it's Africa and, and, and so forth. So that's the first thing. The second thing about differences in detection and management, we do see some differences in terms of that. So for instance, we see less use of combination therapies, and that may be due to availability of treatments. It may be due to other barriers. And combination therapy is particularly important, we, as we know we do see a slightly later age of diagnosis. And one of the interesting findings that, that we've looked at in homozygous FH, for example, is that 
between you've got to be a little bit careful about how you look at this. We've looked at high versus non-high income countries. And if you look at non-high income countries, the survival is reduced by about one decade. And that is almost entirely explained by age of detection, the number of treatments that you use, and therefore the cholesterol level that you ultimately achieve. So if, for example, in regions like Africa, we could move towards detection early, we may not be able to solve the problem with two, three, you know, David had a very nice slide of all the treatments. And we know that some of those treatments may become available later. But there are simple oral medications, combination therapy, statins, azetamide. If you could shift the diagnosis 20 years earlier through simple maybe point of care testing, maybe redefine the cutoffs and so forth, what you could do is start those people on appropriate treatment. So that means you're going to defer the potential need for three, four, or more expensive drugs. But if you make that diagnosis late, that's a huge problem. So I think we have to think about some specific issues in that region. And the other thing I think we, as again, highlighted something very practical. The later you make a diagnosis, the more behavior is, is already set adversely. And so things like BMI, smoking, which will accelerate risk of atherosclerosis. You don't want any of that around. So if we can move that detection, it's got to be before the age of 20, 18, ideally. And, you know, for homozygous FH, probably by the age of about six. So I think those are my key takers for some of the work that we've done. David, you have your hand back up and then I'll bring in Alexandros for some comments. Right. Thanks. Um, I saw there was one question, but I'll first respond on something else. Um, and that is uh, the prevalence of FH. I was quite uh, interested to see the data that Ashraf collected about acute coronary syndrome and FH. In our coronary care um, experience, um, in, in the, the premature heart disease of FH is quite prominent. It's about 10 to 20% of people in the coronary care unit. And that is irrespective of the ethnic origin, the age at which FH presents. And for us, it's particularly important in a country with many immigrant, immigrant groups that there are founder effects in many of the populations. So it's even commoner in some of the members, it's not one in 300 that is a good figure, but it's more likely one in 70 to one in 100 in the Afrikaner and the Jewish and the Gujarati Indian communities with some other communities as well. So um, in, in unfortunately for us, um, we discovered that premature coronary disease was really um, rife in the black population at a young age. And that was mostly years of poorly managed diabetes and hypertension. But within that uh, uh, group, uh, premature heart disease from FH was present with the typical Achilles tendons and thermometer that one would see. So the, the, pat, the, the pattern is not very different. And there was a question about the xanthometer. For us, uh, our Southern African black population has a particularly high prevalence of an autosomal dominantly inherited this beta. And that gene is present in about uh, maybe one in 16 of the population. But of course, it only becomes dyslipidemic much later. And the physical signs are actually commoner and tendons and thermometer can also occur. And I suspect that that gene is all around Africa. We've at the moment got work going on in Ghana, looking at the prevalence of the arginine one four five cysteine mutation. So there's an enormous amount of work to be done. The bias that the African population doesn't have dyslipidemia is wrong. Uh, yeah. I think it's just not being picked up. And there are severe monogenic disorders that I hope people can recognize by the physical signs, which uh, can spark it before there is a complication. Thank you, David. Alexandros, any comments or, 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 
or uh, questions for our speakers? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, dear friends, I'm very happy to participate in this uh, uh, very formative webinar. I hope this webinar will be very helpful to, to, to the audience. And also, uh, I'm very pleased to participate in the EAS educational activities in African countries. Now, as concerns the, the, the uh, topic we are discussing today, Professor Reda said that uh, there is a high prevalence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in Egypt and possibly to other African countries. Do you have data? Uh, for, first of all, congratulations for the Cardio Risk Project you run. Thank you. So, so do you have data to let us know about differences in the prevalence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease uh, among the various African countries? Because Africa has Mediterranean countries, but also we have South Africa and Central uh, African countries. So we have here with us Professor Mare, who can inform us. We have uh, Professor Gamra, concerning the Mediterranean countries, mm -hmm. but also Ga concerning Nigeria and other countries. So this is one question. And the second uh, question, which is to all participants from the African countries, we did not discuss at all about LP Litlay. Do you have data about the existence of LP, the percentage of LP Litlay among different uh, population, different ethnicities and different countries in Africa? Well, let me uh, comment uh, first, uh, if you allow me. Uh, regarding the different uh, profile in different African countries, I think the, uh, the data is, uh, is very is, is small, uh, very little. We have very little data about the prevalence uh, in African countries. Uh, however, that's why uh, in, 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 in my presentations, I, uh, I, I stressed on the fact that uh, 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 Egypt has uh, uh, multiple uh, uh, ethnic descent. Uh, it may represent, uh, 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 we have uh, relation to South Europe and Mediterranean. We have relation to the North Africa and South of Egypt is Nubian and the African, from African descent. And we have some uh, uh, patients, of, of course, from different centers all over Egypt, even from uh, Arish and Sinai, which is actually part of Asia uh, rather than uh, Africa. The, this is first. So, uh, we will hear from uh, uh, Gamra and Dr. David if there is, uh, they know about some uh, data. The second point about lipoprotein A. Lipoprotein A is very difficult. Uh, you have to, we have to expect it or screen at least as uh, the guidelines once in life. And, and nobody, I think, do this. Uh, we have also to check it if we have premature atherosclerosis with no abnormal elevation in the lipid as usual in, for FH, FH patient. However, there is big problem in the diagnosis of uh, investigations and laboratory work for lipoprotein little a. Uh, uh, I think this is a worldwide problem. So we don't know uh, uh, the uh, the standard of uh, uh, diagnosis of high uh, LP, uh, little a, despite that uh, uh, it is very, uh, uh, not only atherogenic, as you know, but thrombogenic. And uh, uh, we, we, we notice some patients with uh, a mosaicus familial hypercholesterolemia uh, uh, who have uh, severe aortic stenosis, uh, I, I think the lipoprotein should be checked in many uh, phenotypes of our patients. Very good answer. Thank you. Um, I want to basically also just maybe ask uh, some of our, our... Do we have any additional questions I can't see in the chat box? Okay. So uh, I, 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 I'm, That was a chance... I made there. Um, oh, for, fantastic. Uh, thank you, David. Professor Aga. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, all the presenters, for the excellent uh, presentation. Uh, I have a question for uh, Professor Marais. Uh, since you work in, uh, in a multi ethnic environment like South Africa, are there differences in the mode of presentation? 
uh, of um, high polypidemia in the different ethnic groups. And the second is that um, among Africans, the stigma of uh, uh, hyperlipidemia is you normally pick them. Is yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to clarify what you asked about the stigmata. How often do we see that in, in people of uh, native African origin? Yeah. Yeah, what I mean is the xanthomas and uh, xanthelasma. Um, when, when we deal with it, is, uh, we deal very broadly with dyslipidemia because um, the, the services are, and expertise are very limited. So um, when we see um, heterozygous FH across all the ethnic groups, the physical signs are the same. The problem is it's not so well studied, that, but it does appear that they, uh, the thick tendon is mostly only palpable in heterozygotes after the age of 25. And that's why the chemical screening is still uh, quite important. Um, and about 80% of people will have it in their 40s. But it requires uh, attention by the clinician to develop experience in palpating tendons. And that, I think, is not taught well enough at undergraduate level so that the Achilles tendons and Thoma is recognized. And it can be either a nodule that is palpable um, or the tendon can be uniformly enlarged to a large, long cylinder. Um, and uh, one has to feel many tendons to become comfortable with that. What we find, um, particularly in the, in the black population, is that this beta lipoproteinemia is not suspected when there are eruptive and tubo-eruptive and tuberous xanthomata and even palmar crease xanthomata of the illustration I showed. That's why I think when health services are not... Um, very well supported. It's very important to recognize the physical sign because that's quick and easy and then one does need to investigate. Um, when it comes to lipoprotein little a that was mentioned earlier, I just want to make the point that we don't actually know how much it influences risk in our African, um, indigenous African population. We have seen young fit people with acute coronary syndromes together with very high lipoprotein little a. It certainly is more prevalent in the black population and doesn't seem to be enormously predisposing. I think that's because the lifestyle is not as westernized for the most part. But nevertheless, there have been young people with premature uh, coronary disease where it appears almost only lipoprotein little a is the uh, explanation. Thanks, David. I hope maybe that just, that. Thank, thank you, you very much. And maybe I'll just add something about live protein little aid. There's not a lot of data about between different ethnicities. We, we do know that in South Asians and also uh, in, in certainly native African populations, LPA is higher. When you look at the relationship, so you start a little bit higher. If you look at the relationship between higher and lower, but the same unit change in LP little aid, in a white, in uh, you know, somebody of South Asian origin or um, African origin, the, it's the same risk, albeit that you have very little or not very little, you have less data, so wider conference intervals. So a high LP little a anywhere in the world compared to somebody who's otherwise matched, let's say for ethnicity, you're going to be at higher risk by a similar sort of amount. So that that's... I think, great. Alexandros, any other uh, sort of comments? I mean, one of the things I think that's really important here is that there's a lot of work that's being done on, on trying to raise awareness. And, you know, I mean, I'm a cardiologist by training, but I've given up on doing procedures a long time ago, and I've you know, focused on prevention. And I think we really have to realize that actually that the life years that we can gain through detection and treatment early, and we have 
if you like, just as the interventional cardiologist has a whole bunch of you know, the different stents and catheters, the tools, the targeting of different causal pathways that we can now target, the key thing is about recognizing it and starting earlier. And I think one of the points that was made about GPs and primary care is that we have to think about raising awareness there. The specialists on perhaps on the call today and on the panel can only see patients if they're referred into them. You're not going to go out there and, and actively find those patients. So we have to think about systems of healthcare and that sort of network hub and spoke almost, and whether that's done virtually. I mean, David, you showed some fantastic pictures. You know, we're doing this via Zoom. If the one thing that the good thing that the last two years has taught us is you can do a lot of virtual work. There is nothing to stop you once a week or, or you know, having or once a month having those. You recognize this and you've got a list of results and almost that consultation. So, Professor Gamera, do you have any any thoughts? I've, you've raised your hand. Yes. <clears throat> Uh, Professor Ray, what, what you were saying was absolutely right, and I think it's the ideal scenario, which is to detect the disease and to treat it aggressively. Now, we have a reality in Africa uh, regarding dyslipidemia, which is actually, it is detected after an event, and it is treated as a secondary prevention, other than primary prevention, we're actually, we're, we're having issues with that. Uh, this is the first thing, and until we have uh, early studies to uh, to answer the uh, the question that was asked by Asher a few moments ago, uh, perhaps we need to do studies in Africa with Pascal, with uh, Yava, etc. Uh, until that time, we need to deal with our reality. Uh, so the first thing, is dyslipidemia is treated as a secondary prevention. The second point, dyslipidemia uh, is rarely isolated when we see these patients. Most of the time, uh, it's associated with diabetes, with hypertension, with overweight or obesity. And one of the approaches that uh, I'm just suggesting, and they would like to have your opinion about that, and it's uh, quite a fashion now, is to try to target these patients on um, uh, that are at high risk because of the diabetes, hypertension, etc., to get them the polypill approach. We see to treat you know, to give them uh, polypill with the uh, hypertension drugs, aspirin, statin, uh, as it was shown in many studies, and the latest one is TIP3, where actually we have participated in that trial as a, an African contribution to that study. And the results are very striking with a, the, with a reduction of more than 30% of cardiovascular events. Uh, five years uh, of, after, after five years of follow-up in patients who have not an event as a primary prevention. Would that approach be an acceptable approach uh, yes. as alternative to the ID scenario that you have this, just described? Absolutely. I think the polypill approach, that you have to find solutions based upon the problems in your region. I mean, there's, there's no point in thinking about, I'm going to try and do this from here, if the infrastructure or the practicality doesn't. So the first thing to think about is, is there much harm from what I'm doing? These drugs are pretty safe. You know, if you were picking a combination of a statin at a, uh, a low or moderate intensity and a dose in a pill with the CCB, for example, um, that's a pretty easy, well to to easily tolerated um, combination. And I know with the blood pressure lowering, for example, you know, if you talk to hypertension colleagues, well, we've got to look at this very carefully. But if your average systolic is, you know, 140, 150, you're not going to make people fall over. There's no worry with a low LDL and you're not going to get down to really low levels anyway. So, you know, let's not even worry about that. These people are not going to fall over. We need to think about this like if you save for retirement, you start at 24 versus starting at 60. The person starting at 24, you get that cumulative benefit. So those small changes in both blood pressure and LDL, and this was some of the work that Brian Ferentz and we, and myself and others published in, in, in a JAMA paper, that if you maintain a small difference in LDL and blood pressure, lifelong, you could probably reduce your relative risk of cardiovascular disease by about 80%. 
So I think that's one of the things. The second problem will be if you adopt the usual 10-year risk that we've adopted, because age matters so much, I think you've got to change, either use lifetime or you basically think about a lower threshold. Because if you want to you know, start treatment in a younger person, there's no point in using a 10-year risk threshold that is very high. They're not going to get that, even with a high lipid profile or blood pressure uh, and so forth, because age is such a big determinant. So I think we need those pragmatic solution. And that's part of population health and the Jeffrey Rose you know, hypothesis. Move the whole population distribution. And you've got to think about, and I think we haven't talked about this, is, you know, and, uh, and Ashraf showed this, smoking. You've got to think about that. You know, one of the biggest impacts in Europe was the ban on smoking in public places. It started to change behavior. It is still a problem in South America and in Africa uh, and in the MENA region particularly. You could halve some of that, and all of these things matter. David and then Ashraf. Uh, yeah, I, I want to, uh, the, the, the pedigram presented by David is very interesting about the, uh, the difference between uh, a, a guy and his grandfather regarding the age of onset of atherosclerosis according to lifestyle. Uh, w when the lifestyle was good, he had heart attack, at, uh, he lived till the age of 70. When the lifestyle is bad, he had atherosclerosis at a very early age. So I think... Uh, uh, smoking, as uh, Ray uh, just <coughs> mentioned, and diet is very important because till now, we don't know what is the healthy diet, actually. Actually, even our recommendation is changing over the last few years. Uh, uh, we start to realize that carbs and sugars are bad than fats. So I think dieting is uh, should uh, uh, be considered as a target of uh, 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 real studies to study the behavior of different uh, uh, groups about the dieting and its effect on atherosclerosis. <clears throat> David. Okay, um, thanks. Um, just uh, well, I wanted to make the point when I classified this lipidemia, they somewhat arbitrary cutoffs for grading it from mild to moderate to severe to extreme. But I'm quite concerned about the management of the extreme cases. Um, the reason, although they're very rare, uh, some of those disorders uh, are very important to recognize for that individual to have a better future. So one of the problems we see is with extreme hypertriglycerodemias, in which the cholesterol is often in the order of 10 to 20 millimoles per liter, that it's misdiagnosed as homozygous FH. And if it's such severe hypertriglyceridemia, then um, the diet is usually extremely effective and the statins do nothing. Mm. And the PCSK9 uh, 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 monoclonals also will do nothing. So one of our big successes is changing a triglyceride of uh, almost, uh, uh, what was it, 695 millimoles per liter. That's more than 50 thousand milligrams per deciliter and the diet then dropped it to about four millimoles per liter and there was no need for medication. These people die of pancreatitis. So that's not a cardiology problem, but also in the cardiology sphere, particularly in our black population, we have had somebody uh, not recognized with a homozygous FH phenotype but um, one of the particular patients had um, cytostrolemia yeah. and would have been destined for death in her teenagers, but changing her diet, there wasn't funding for uh, drugs, changing the diet dropped the cholesterol from 20 to 4 millimoles per liter, and uh, she needed no medication, and statins also don't work in that condition. So... Unfortunately, and this is my hope for taking part in meeting up with everyone in Africa, unfortunately, these unusual cases have no place for the proper workup. Um, and sometimes one can innovate some uh, strategies of diagnosis and make a tremendous difference. And we need to learn about these disorders, as well as the moderate uh, dyslipidemia and heterozygous FH. One does not want to 
exaggerate the importance of these rare conditions. But for those patients, it's very important. Thank you, David. And I think we're, we're getting to the end of the hour. One of the things I want to say is I want to thank all of our speakers and our panelists. Uh, and one of the things that we have been committed to as the, EA, as, as the EAS and our leadership role is that part of our organization is that under uh, law, under Sweden, we basically of the society income. And so we have to basically reinvest that in activities. And at our last executive committee, we approved uh, that we would basically provide some funding, both for being you know, on sabbaticals to other centers for, for young people. But part of it also is around education with a particular focus on Africa and certainly Central Eastern Europe as well. So where we can actually do a lot of good. And perhaps one of the practical things about this is that maybe listening to what David and others have actually said, is that we can look at exploring how we might do that in the form of a virtual, let's say, practical workshop and get much more hands on. How do you set up a lipid test? How do you make a diagnosis a bit more? You've seen the biology and thinking now about how you practically put that into practice. So a lot, lot of work to do. But with that, I'm going to hand over to my friend and colleague, Alberto Zambon. Professor Zambon, thank you. Well, thank you, Kosh. Let me end up this webinar by thanking the speakers. Excellent, very clear and practical presentations, moderators and Professor Ray as a chair. Uh, as mentioned at the very beginning, this is the first step in a process that uh, uh, AAS wants to uh, take farther in terms of building a broader and fruitful collaboration between uh, the society and the African National Scientific Societies interested in atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. Thanks also to all the attendees and thanks to the EAS, IAVA, the Lipid Association uh, of Southern Africa and the G Nigerian Cardiac Society and Tunisian Heart Foundation. Thank you all. And the promise is this is going to be the first of a number of future events involving EAS and the African National Societies. Thank you. Thank you very much to all. Bye-bye. Have a nice weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.